just so thankful that, like we just sang, God, it as well. I thank you that you give us that peace, God, and you, you, you let that be something that we can have from you, God. And I just thank you for that. Thank you for everything that you do for us, God. I thank you for this sunny day and a, a week that was just so dreary, God. I thank you that you can be that for us. And I just thank you for all that. I just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let's get a seat. Bible Church, you are there, but Linda. Hey, everybody, welcome to Solid Rock Bible Church. You are there, but Linda and I are not. We are up at Starwood Ranch in Calcasca, Michigan, but I couldn't pass up an opportunity to be able to do announcements while wearing a baseball hat and shorts uh, because Pastor Brad would never normally allow that. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm the pastor of Student Ministries. This is Linda Nimmo. She's on staff at the church as well, and she is the uh, administrative guru handling all the important details for our student ministries. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, we're just throwing up our COVID reminders here. Hope you're doing well, safe at home, staying healthy. If you're not feeling well, just stay at home, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, we appreciate everybody who dials in online every week and stays connected with us as a church. Uh, so whether you're there in person or you're joining us online, welcome. We're glad you're here. We also want to let you know for people who are getting more connected with the church that we have a membership class coming up on March the 7th. If you have questions about that, you can just uh, send an email us into us at the church. You can talk to Pastor Brad today. Um, just let us know that you're interested in coming to that and you want to take your membership to the next level here at Solid Rock Bible Church. Also, our Awana programs are getting going in March. Uh, so if you haven't heard about those yet, uh, we've been posting those on our Facebook group. Stephanie Cannon, our director, has been sending them out. It's going to be a little bit of a different schedule, and it's only open to those uh, in our current Awana and church families. So if you're interested in jumping in, getting registered, let us know because we're getting going in just a couple of weeks. That's all our announcements for today. Yeah, thanks everybody. It was good to see you today, but... Jack, I just, I just wish we knew where our students were. I knew they were around here somewhere. I yeah. uh, just got to figure out where they can help us appear. Hey, everybody, let's next So those are our middle schoolers up north and uh, having a great weekend. So um, be praying for them. Great to know that Pastor Jack's dreams came true of being on Sunday morning doing announcements in shorts, because yes, I would not allow that on stage. No one needs to see those legs any more than we just saw. So uh, we are, we're excited that you're here today. We have a special Sunday. Uh, we are commissioning uh, our newest elder, Chuck McBay, but we're also in Acts chapter 6, which talks about leadership in the church and the need for leadership in the church and the need for growing the leadership in the church and so if you have your Bibles, if you're at home, uh, sorry about the technical difficulties we've been having all morning with our uh, Subsplash, which is our website and our app, and YouTube. Any, any idea if it's up and running, Jaden? So still not. Uh, Facebook is working, uh, but nothing else is. So if you chose to attend in person today, you picked the right day, all right? So we're glad that you're here, and uh, we're going to go back to Acts chapter 1, actually, where uh, we walk through the apostles replacing Judas. So we're going to be in Acts 1 and in Acts 6, and we're going to end up commissioning Chuck as our new elder. It's going to be a wonderful, awesome day. You're going to hear from each of the elders uh, as we walk through these scriptures together. And uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who guides the church in leadership. It, the Holy Spirit guides the leaders as they look to make decisions. We we try to uh, really seek the Spirit's wisdom and guidance as the elders operate and function. And uh, we experience a lot of unity in the last, I'd say, 15 years here at Solid Rock because the leadership has been united, because the leadership has sought wisdom from the Spirit. And we don't really, we don't really move without them. In fact, we've tabled many decisions. We've, we've gone slower than some people like us to go sometimes because we're waiting for God to give us clarity on things as we make decisions in the church. And so it's so important for you to understand that you need godly leaders. Uh, if you've been in church your whole life, you really know that. You've probably experienced having ungodly leaders. Uh, I feel like so many of us have experienced that 
in the past. And so it's so important that you pray for your leaders, pray for the elders, the deacons, the ministry leaders here in our church, that they would walk with God, that they would be empowered by the Spirit. And um, as we look at Acts chapter 1 and chapter 6 today, uh, verse 15 in chapter 1, we find the uh, apostles talking, Peter is talking uh, with them about prophecy and about prophecy being fulfilled. And get this, about their, them themselves fulfilling it. So it's this kind of this historic, historic place in the scriptures where they, are, they're, they know what the scriptures say and now they're going to be a part of fulfilling prophecy from David. So um, look at it in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120. So we're backing up to chapter 1, which means that the, the 120 disciples of Jesus at this time, uh, before the Spirit comes, before the day of Pentecost, before the 3,000 are added, and then daily they add to their number into the thousands, they're 120. They're waiting for the Spirit still to come. So uh, we've already preached through chapter 1. We're in, in chapter 6 today. But I wanted to get you back to this mindset. It says, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning who? Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Think about uh, what it must have been like to be the 11 disciples here at this point. And, and Peter's bringing up Judas. And then he's bringing up David prophesying about Judas, that he would be the betrayer, that that, uh, you know, one of the things we're really pressing into the church about is being disciples and making disciples. Don't you know that Jesus uh, wasn't perfect at making disciples? He got 11 out of the 12 to actually follow him. One did not. So that should be encouraging to you. And it also tells us something about making disciples, that you will pour your life into other people, and you will walk with them, and you will talk with them about Jesus, and some of them will break your heart. Some of them will... Uh, make your life just great because you're, you're so excited to see them grow and to see them flourish and then go on and make disciples, which is what disciples do. They make disciples. And so here, uh, Peter is quoting uh, David in verse 20 about Judas. It says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. And so David has prophesied years and hundreds of years before that Judas would betray the Lord. He will, we know uh, if you read the verses between there that he goes and he commits suicide in a field and it's just this kind of ugly, bloody scene of what, it, what it, it did to his own heart to betray the Lord. Uh, but we arrive here in verse 20 with this fact that they had to um, replace him in his office. And so I'm going to have Dave continue on and read in verse 21 for us and talk us through how they did that. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. We're just going to pick up right off where uh, Brad left off. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called our Sabbath and was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which of these two men you have chosen. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Peter is picking up uh, on the same conversation, talking to the same group of 120, and saying, because of David's prophesy, prophecy, we need to replace Judas with another apostle so there would be a, a 12th apostle. And he gives the 120 a commission that they are to find men who are qualified. And he lists three qualifications. First, the replacement must come from the group of 120, that inner circle of people who are close followers of Jesus. The second qualification is that the replacement must have been a, a daily traveling companion of Jesus. Somebody was, who was with him when he was walking in and walking out among us. Uh, 
a, a witness to his miracles, his teaching, his suffering, his death. And finally, qualification three was similar to qualification two, but focuses on the resurrection. And that is that the person who is qualified to fill this void of being an apostle must have uh, witnessed the Lord himself after he rose from the grave. Now, the reason for these stringent requirements is because of the mission that God was calling the apostles to do. They were to set the foundation of the church for generations to come, and every generation that succeeds them would build upon this foundation. It had to be a, found, uh, had to be a foundation built on the strong witness of uh, eyewitnesses, the truth, uh, the power, the unwavering faith that they demonstrated was part of what needed to be there. And so the group did their job, and they proposed two people, not one. Barsabbas and Matthias. So the disciples had to break the tie, and they didn't want to do it themselves. They wanted the Lord to make this decision. So they did what uh, the Hebrew people had done in years past. They cast lots. Now, for you and I, lots seems kind of trivial and almost irreligious. But to them, it was a very dignified procedure, and it was a way of choosing or allowing God to choose for them. It could be anything from a coin flip to a, a, some version of pickup sticks or a dice throw or something like that. Nevertheless, Proverbs 16.33 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but the Lord makes all the decisions. So this is what they felt, and this is what they believed. And so the account says they prayed. They prayed to God, who is omniscient, who is sovereign and who has the ability to control all the details of life to show who he has chosen through the casting of lots. And the account goes on to say they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias and he was added to their number. Now it's important to understand one thing about casting lots and that is that uh, since the Holy Spirit has come and we are indwelt by the Spirit, we have no need to do something like that because we have the divine guidance within us. And we can make our own decisions regarding what we need to do and in and, and controlling the affairs of the church. But then they didn't have that. And so they, by faith, used the casting of lots for, for the Lord to make important decisions on their behalf. Um, and so the twelfth man is added. Now they have 12 powerful witnesses to share the gospel, to go to the ends of the earth, to establish that firm foundation of the church, to witness in an unwavering way through their writings, their teachings, their sermons, and their life. And now the stage is set for history's, one of history's greatest moments, and that's the coming of the Spirit and the birth of the church. Thanks, Dave. So we pick up then in chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, so how do we get here? So we leave off with the 12 and the 120 in chapter 1. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And the day of Pentecost comes. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They go out into the streets. They're preaching with boldness. And it says 3,000 were added to their number in that one day. Then on into the next chapter, chapter 3, we have Peter and John healing the lame man at the temple, again, bringing the gospel in boldness, and their numbers increase. It says to 5,000 then. So, of course, they're rejoicing at all these new souls who, that have come into the body, um, but they've also recognized the needs of those people as they come into the body. And in chapter 4, they uh, collectively bring together the extras that they have, the abundance they have, to be redistributed amongst the, the brethren. It says in chapter 4 that there was not a needy among them, uh, that the Lord's generosity and his Holy Spirit was working through his church. But it didn't take, lo take long for sin to enter in to the camp, and we see in chapter 5 God's judgment and his holiness on display over Ananias and Sapphira, and then again more signs and wonders being performed through the apostles. And it says in chapter 5 that <clears throat> such a multitude was coming into the faith 
that when the apostles would walk through Jerusalem and the surrounding towns, that people would flood out of their houses into the streets, hoping that just Peter's shadow would gaze over them so they would be healed. And so the influx of thousands of people in such a short period of time had occurred, and the needs of the people were great and great and great and, and getting greater by the day. So continuing in verse 1, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So you see, it didn't take long. From chapter 4 to chapter 6, the unity that they had in Christ and the Holy Spirit was now, it was now being attacked by sin in the camp. In division along cultural lines, the, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the Hebrews uh, from the Judea region, the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And so much time was being devoted to just take care of the physical needs of the body that the spiritual needs of the body were being neglected. So in verse 2, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, unless we think that they're diminishing the work of serving the body and, and meeting the physical needs we only need to go back to Jesus as their example. When, when the crowds were gathering to him, he fed the 5,000. He took care of their physical needs first as a way of showing them the spiritual need for their hunger for him. And, and in the next uh, chapter after the feeding of the 5,000, he tells them that he is the bread of life, that they're to live and feed from him. So again, it, the transition from meeting the physical needs to meeting the spiritual needs was ever present with Christ, it's ever present with the church. But the problem is the emphasis and the energy is being spent here meeting the physical needs at the behest of the spiritual needs. So there's a need for leadership for this new church of thousands and thousands, a need for godly men to come alongside and to uh, be able to free up the apostles to do the work that they're called to. In verse 4, the apostles say, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So again, there arises a need for leadership to decentralize all the authority from the apostles and to bring up godly men to be able to take over some of these other responsibilities of the church so that uh, the leadership can then be devoted in prayer, filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, in charge with the teaching uh, and the presentation of the word and the preaching of boldness. Now, there were qualifications for for both sets of men. It wasn't just the apostles that were to be spiritual in their work, and then uh, we can have, you know, the more carnal men take on the other jobs. Um, there's a quality uh, of men that they looked for, that they sought, again, from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Chuck is going to lead us in this next session. Okay, here we pick up in uh, verse 3 where Luke is introducing us to a new office within the church. Um, it's an office to serve the members of the church. It's an office to help the elders come along uh, and take some of the responsibility of the day-to-day the -day service and, and to take that for them. Um, it says in Acts 3, uh, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of wisdom and uh, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. The word therefore is a really good linking word in Scripture. Um, I kind of look at it as it says because of, and all of the things that we talked about, that Steve talked about, and that Brad talked about, the exponential growth of the church, the, the need within the church to, to help the body is the reason for this office. Um, but we as humans, we tend to look at these offices in the church and we super spiritualize them. And I think we tend to do that as a way to alleviate ourselves and say we're not qualified to hold these offices when, in fact, we really are. So Scripture in this here gives us three different things that the apostles said as far as parameters. The first one is they needed to be of good repute. Now, it's important when we think of that, we're not talking about somebody who is perfect because if that was the case, nobody would qualify for any of these offices. So that's, that's not the criteria. The criteria is simple, simply somebody that has a good reputation. Um, 
somebody who is a, a, a man of integrity, they're honest, and they're thought well of not only within the church but outside of the church in their communities. Um, and then it talks about being uh, full, somebody that's full of the Spirit. Simply that is you're being guided by the Holy Spirit. He is leading you and leading me in our day-to-day activities. And then somebody that's full of wisdom. We are making decisions for God's church. So we need to do that through prayer. We need to do that through counsel of others. And we need to do that with a hesitancy, if at all possible, so we don't act rash out of our own, uh, out of our own wisdoms. So as a follower of a Christ, um, these may seem like they're high and lofty ideas to get to, but really they're not. They're actually a really simple list and a simple thing to obtain because we have the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit is leading us. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks for, uh, for laying out the qualifications of being a, a godly and church uh, leader. Uh, within the church body, and, and thanks, Steve, for also just kind of bringing us up to speed on the importance of leadership, additional leadership in the church uh, to help others and to come alongside others um, that are praying for folks, et cetera, because that, that type of thing that occurred back in these New Testament times are occur- is occurring with us today. We still have the same needs. So if you go back into Acts 6, what Luke writes about in, in verses 5 and 6, he says, this proposal please the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Pacaris, Nicanor, Timon, Promenace, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So just looking at verse 6, The act of commissioning took place when the apostles prayed and laid hands on this group of seven men who were to overlook those in need within the church at that time. These were men that were full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. But commissioning didn't occur just in the New Testament or it's not occurring today in the the, uh, current church. It actually had started occurring back in the Old Testament times. In Numbers chapter 27, verses 18 and 19, Moses commissioned Joshua. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. And then it goes on in verse 23, Moses did as the Lord commanded and laid hands on him and commissioned him. So in essence, commissioning is exhibited by the laying of hands on an individual and praying within the church. Commissioning shows both approval as well as empowerment for that chosen task, and in this case for Chuck, to be an elder at Solid Rock. So you see the word and deed working together hand in hand. You see the need for leadership so that the, the deeds of the church, the needs of the church could be met through the deeds of the church that are the good works that were being done, but we needed to expand the leadership at this point so that the church could continue to thrive and continue to grow. And I really believe that as a church, we have to kind of prepare ourselves for what's coming down the road. I really believe that this pandemic that uh, is worldwide is a huge call and opportunity from God for people to hit their needs and to come to a knowledge that they desperately need him. And when people do come to that point, we need to be prepared as the church with deeds and the word in order to see as many people come into the kingdom of God as possible. And that God wants to cause a revival. God wants to see people come to him in great numbers. And I really believe that as Solid Rock Bible Church, we need to do everything we can to get ourselves ready for that. We need to be making disciples right now who make disciples. We need to be investing in word and deed kind of ministry. We need to understand that God has a plan for us in all of this, that there's going to become an issue uh, of social distancing. There's going to be people coming to the kingdom, and we're going to have to be ready for that. Um, When you get to verse 7, it says, And the word of the Lord 
uh, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So some amazing things happen here in this one little verse. One is that the word of God continues. After they, after they uh, establish more leaders to do the work of the ministry amongst the body that is there in the church, the, the apostles are able to take the word and increase it more and more. And then because the word is increasing, look what's happening. The number of disciples are multiplying, that people are being uh, discipled and made disciples, and this multiplication is taking place. This exponential growth is happening and continuing to do that. But it's happening at a deeper, greater level through the ability of having more people involved in the leadership of the church. And then a great many of the priests become obedient to the faith. So there's priests that are in, they're, they're in uh, Israel, they're Jewish priests, they're believing the law, but now they've put their faith in Jesus. And they have come into the faith, they've come into the body of Christ, they've come into the church, they've come into the new covenant, out of the old covenant, they've come to a full understanding who Jesus is. You've got to believe that these priests now uh, are becoming a huge part of the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How great would it be if Solid Rock Bible Church became a place where people gave up their livelihood to go be missionaries across the world? How great would it be if Solid Rock Bible Church, uh, that parents held their hands, hands open when it came to their children and said, Lord, if you want to call my children into ministry, you can have them in the ministry. How great would it be that we would send uh, and grow up people to be pastors and missionaries? And yes, you can spread the gospel in any workplace, in any place that you go, understand that. But there is going to be a great need for people to give the their lives fully over to the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God has called us to be prepared for this. And this is what you see happening here in the early church. And I want to suggest to you that this is what should be happening uh, in the late church, in the church of now, that God hasn't changed his plan and, and his desires and his, wills, his will for us. So today we want to challenge you with that, and we want to also... Um, model and demonstrate taking on new leadership at, uh, we would say, the highest level of the church, which is being an elder. But if you understand what an elder is, it's to serve all and to serve, to, to be a leader, a servant leader. And so it's a very humbling thing. Chuck McBay is our newest elder, and we want to commission him uh, together here today. And so I'm going to read to you the qualifications that Chuck talked about uh, in 1 Timothy 3, they're also in Titus 1 of an elder. And if you go on in, in 1 Timothy 3, you see similar qualifications for deacons um, that, that we just read about in Acts 6. But it says this in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, The saying is trustworthy. Anyone who aspires to the office of an overseer or an elder, he desires a noble task. And so this is very important that uh, someone would have a calling in their life and a desire to fulfill that calling. And when we talked to Chuck, um, he was able to tell us about that, that God had called him and put that desire in his heart uh, for ministry and leadership uh, as, a, as a young person. And I uh, hate to break it to you, Chuck, but you're not young anymore. Uh, but the, here what, here's what God is faithful, and he's bringing this to today where we're celebrating this, we're commissioning, Chuck. It's a, it's a joy, uh, but it has to, it's a serious calling uh, that you would feel in your life that God is calling you to a noble task. It's a desire, uh, this noble task. Verse 2, therefore an overseer must be above reproach. And so to be above reproach is to not have obvious things in your life where people can kind of go, aha, or get a handle and say, You're, this is terribly out of whack and out of line with Scripture, that, that it is not being perfect, but it is being in line with the Scriptures and being a godly person to be above reproach. And really the list here is describing what it means to be above reproach, the areas of our lives. So the husband of one wife, so your marriage must be above reproach, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So if you want to know what it means to be a godly person, th this qualification list has to do with an elder, but it has to do with being godly, and we're all called to be 
godly. Verse 4, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be uh, well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And so I've asked Dave Scholl to uh, bring a charge to Chuck on our behalf as elders, but also at, uh, on your behalf as a church body that uh, is participating with this day uh, with Chuck. So Dave's going to read Chuck a uh, charge from, from the elders. Hello, Chuck. Would you step forward, please? <clears throat> Chuck, as you know, the elders of Solid Rock for quite a while have been praying to the Lord for guidance in terms of adding to our numbers. And you have indicated to us that you feel that God has called you to serve as an elder in the church and that you are willing to do so, and motivated to do so, uh, not from compulsion and not for dishonest gain. We are here today to confirm this decision. We have prayed over you. We have prayed for you. We have talked with you many times, and we have sought input from the body concerning you. All of the encouragement that we've received is confirmation from the Lord to us that we are making the right decision. We charge you to carry out the responsibilities as an elder in the following ways. To walk worthy of your calling by modeling the character of a true disciple of Jesus. To be a good steward of the flock until the Lord returns by faithfully shepherding, leading, feeding, protecting, and building up in truth and love. To run the good race and fight the good fight by teaching and defending the truth. To minister as a servant leader with humility, grace, and by putting the needs of others ahead of your own. To seek the mind of Christ, the head of the church, in all things, and if necessary, to set aside your own personal agenda for the sake of what's the good of the church. To maintain unity and to seek to be a peacemaker to love your wife and family as Christ loves the church, to faithfully carry out the Great Commission. Chuck, do you agree to maintain each of these things among your highest priorities? We invite you all to join us with prayer by bowing your heads and raising your hands in support as the elders lay hands on Chuck and pray. And as we lay hands on you, Chuck, we commission you to do the work of the ministry of elder at Solid Rock Bible Church. And at the same time, we call upon God to anoint you to accomplish these things in the power of the, the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's with great joy that uh, we present Chuck to you, a man that you have brought to us. We thank you for the calling of the Holy Spirit on his life to serve in this capacity. And we pray for the humility of the Holy Spirit to go before him that he will go about his work as an elder, uh, looking upon it as a servant of all. Lord, we, uh, we trust that Chuck will seek you and, and work by your power in your spirit according to your word. We pray, Lord, that you protect him and his family from the attacks of the enemy. Um, we know that we serve a a mighty God, and uh, as the kingdom advances, the enemy does what he can to try and thwart the kingdom, but we know, Lord, that uh, with you, all things are possible, and, and with God on our side, who can be against us? But that occurs in humility, and, and we pray for humility, and we pray for unity. We pray for unity amongst uh, us as elders, to be of one mind, that of your Holy Spirit, only directing where you have led us first, only speaking where you have spoken first. Lord, we pray for your perfect peace to be upon our decision-making and for uh, the wisdom and discernment to step back when we don't have that clarity that we need. Uh, Lord God, we just uh, lift up Chuck to you. We pray these blessings upon him in Jesus' name. Dear God, we're so thankful that you are a powerful God, 
with power above all and love above all. We're thankful that you have a perfect plan for not just this whole world and for the days to come and the days in the past, but also right down here at Solid Rock for our church body and our church leadership and this community. We're thankful, Lord, that that you've worked on Chuck's heart and Chuck has been willing to step up and accept this role and take on this role as an elder within Solid Rock. Just ask, Lord, that you give him strength and humility, the energy that it needs to be in this role, the ability to see out through the church and see where their needs to be met, to work together with all of us as a team and that we all work together as a team, Lord, in a prayerful way to continue to grow this church, to grow this community, to make a difference. Just lift up Chuck's family. And Lord, we know that there could be spiritual attack. There could be all kinds of things that go on now uh, in Chuck's life and his family life. I just ask that you put a protective hedge around him and his family. Guide him in his ways. Guide him to your word at all times. Give him patience, understanding, and humility. So I just lift Chuck up to you right now, Lord, and ask that you guide him as we move forward as a a group of elders here to make decisions within our church. Give him strength in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day, this uh, moment in time where we get to uh, lay hands on Chuck and commission him, empowering him uh, on behalf of the elders and on behalf of the body of here at Solid Rock that you would be the one who guides him and, and empowers him uh, through your spirit. Give him strength, give him wisdom that he doesn't have on his own. God, give him insight into things uh, that he sees going on, whether it's in the church or in our culture, that you would help him to be fully equipped uh, for every good work that you will call him to do uh, as an elder here at Solid Rock. Lord, we, we pray for the protection of his own spiritual well-being, of his family's uh, lives, God, and, and welfare, God, that you would bless them uh, for the sacrifices that they will make and in, in giving Chuck the time and the Ill ability and the effort uh, that will be needed and required of being an elder. God, that you would um, just continue to grow Chuck uh, in his own walk with you, closer and closer to you, God. Help him not to uh, arrive, but to be transformed continually by conforming more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for each of our elders in that same capacity, God, that you would continue to unite us in our decision-making, continue to unite us in our leadership for the church, our love for the gospel, and our love for uh, the kingdom to grow. And God, that you would position us and give us uh, the unity that we long for as we lead together. And God, that today would be uh, a blessing to Chuck and his family and uh, a blessing to Solid Rock, that today uh, people would recognize our elders uh, as just men that uh, are trying to be more like Jesus and taking the mantle of leadership on their behalf and wanting uh, them to pray for us and uh, keep us before the throne, that we would be humble and truly godly men leading in a way that pleases you. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand in worship with us?